evening. I'm going to look at a lesson tonight entitled, I Will, from oh, Psalm 66, and uh, pretty much the whole chapter is what we're going to be delving into this evening, and it's a little bit of a companion lesson to uh, our lesson this morning when we talked about uh, living responsible lives. Uh, and I talked about how that in that section, midsection of uh, Matthew chapter 6 on through chapter 7, we get into the responsibilities that Jesus said his disciples have uh, as we go out into the world and associate with people, and especially our responsibilities to God and to one another. But uh, I thought this was a, a, a lesson that would be kind of appropriate as we look back at David and the commitment that he has to God's will. So verses 13 through 15 form the kind of nugget that everything else revolves around in this, this great psalm. David writes, I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Selah, and that word selah kind of means just let's just stop, pause for a moment and think about what was just said. So you notice how many times the psalmist there uses I will in just those four verses. I will, I will, I will, I will. Uh, there's a determination that is there. Emphatic statements of determination to worship God in spite of doubt and fear. And typically doubt will lead to fear. And fear will lead to doubt. So they kind of go hand in hand. But nice thing about it is faith leads to victory. No doubt. David uses three historical evidences to establish the majesty of God in our lives. Okay? Now, to establish it in the lives of the people he's talking to directly, lives of us indirectly as he's talking all right so he God has demonstrated his crushing power God has the power to crush things what he chooses now sometimes he doesn't choose to do it why uh, because God's not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance when God crushes something it's because they refuse to repent and, and he's got to protect that which he doesn't want to be destroyed by the enemy. Psalm 66, 3. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. Boy, it didn't look like Pharaoh came cringing to, to God. Right? Not until what? That crushing defeat of the firstborn son. And then it was, get out of here. Boy, then he changed his mind, didn't he? And what happened? He chased the Israelites to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea collapsed on them. What a crushing defeat was there. So this was done when God brought Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Pharaoh was made to submit to the will of God. Now, he didn't want to. And even after he submitted to God's will, he didn't want to. Can you imagine that? After seeing the ten plagues and suffering what he suffered, the loss of his firstborn son, the next Pharaoh, he chooses to still rebel against God. Evil sometimes just won't listen. Won't, won't comprehend what's going on around them. So the plagues were a war carried out not simply against Pharaoh, but against the gods of Pharaoh. 
uh, what are you talking about? Well, you're talking about the frogs. You know, they worshipped frogs. They worshipped flies. They wor flies. Beelzebub. Uh, remember the the movie uh, was the Lord of the Flies? Wasn't that like a horror movie? That there, there's well, some along the line. The that, fly was the horror one where he turned into a fly. Well, that's the fly, but there's there's a different one where you know the the devil you know is like a fly or Satan's like a fly. But but each you know the lice the the, the things that are happening there. Everything kind of represents the the even when they were throwing the Hebrew children, the baby boys, into the Nile River, they worshipped the crocodiles. See, so everything was a uh, a a plague. Uh, it, it was a part of a war against the gods of the Egyptians and the god. Again, remember, Pharaoh had proclaimed himself as a god, so. There it was. Uh, so, again, that last plague crushed the hearts of the Egyptian people. Here's our jewelry. Here's our money. Here, here's stuff. Take our stuff and leave. Please, now. Go before something worse happens to us. And again, the Red Sea crushed the hatred and rebellion of Pharaoh himself. So God will make all of his enemies submit to his authority. And that's what the scriptures tell us. Romans chapter 14, verse 11. For as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow uh, to me and every tongue shall confess to God. There's a crushing that's coming at the end. But for the vast majority of people, again, that submission won't be till eternal condemnation. They just won't won't accept the the. It's like many people who are in prison start out with small crimes, and they'll go to prison for a little while, or go to jail for a little while, whatever. And then just go bigger and bigger and bigger until finally they do something to where they they earn capital punishment. They just don't learn. There's a rebellion that is there within them. So God used His sovereignty to uh, uh, sovereignty of nature, nature, sovereignty over nature, to save Israel. Okay, the Red Sea parting. He used that. Uh, verse 5. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds to word the children of man. And there, the Red Sea. Basic number one. So God calls for us to examine his works. What has he done? There's the testimony. The Bible is testimony of what God has done. We either believe that testimony or we reject it, right? As, as with any other testimony. Are the witnesses credible? Well, I think the witnesses in the Bible are credible. And I think you do too. There are some witnesses out here, people that say things, I don't find them credible. Why? Because there are others that are saying something totally opposite. But could mere men do such things as part the Red Sea and then have it crushed back down in on Pharaoh? Could, could mere men strike a wall or rock and have water come out of it, enough water to feed, si or to feed the thirst or quench the thirst of six million people? Could mere men somehow get whale to come and manna to come down to feed six million people? No. No. That was the work of God. So God, God did that to preserve, save Israel, and God will use his sovereignty to save the church and destroy his enemies. Now listen, to save his church, church is a plural term, right? But you, you know how we talked about that with God. Elohim is plural, but it's translated God in the scriptures. And that's why we say it's, it should be deity, then you know it's Father, Word, Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But church is the same way. Church is singular, 
but it's made up of members, individuals. So there's a plurality. It's like a team, okay? So he will say the church. Now, spiritually, that's true of everybody who's going to be saved, but will he physically save every member of the church? And we know that's not the case because we see the martyrs that are mentioned in the New Testament, like Stephen, like James, like Paul, we know, was beheaded. Peter is said to have been crucified upside down. No. But the church survived. And the church remains. Like Israel remained for its time period. Its time period. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 through 12. We've talked about this. Uh, before, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And usually we, we stop there. Sometimes we go on to verse 9. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord from the glory of His might. Verse 10, when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among, uh, at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. We believe the witnesses, right? Verse 11. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good in every work of faith by his power. Remember those words, work of faith? In, in the Roman letter, Romans chapter 1, I think it's about verse 3, Paul starts off talking about the obedience of faith. And you know what he ends up way over in chapter 16, and I think it's down about the 26th verse? The obedience of faith. Oh, it's not works, it's faith. The obedience of faith, the work of faith. Okay? Now let me pick up where I was. I just wanted to get that one in there. Verse 12. So that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and of and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, yeah, God's going to crush the enemy. Right? But it's because they've refused every opportunity to turn around and serve the Lord. To be saved. But what a tragic thing that is. God purifies people to worship and serve Him. God has purified us to come here and worship and serve Him. That's the only way we are worthy to come here and worship and serve Him. Psalm 66, verse 10 for you, O oh God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. Well, how is silver tried? Heat. It's put through the fire, isn't it? So we've been put through a fire. What fire have we been put through? Uh, let's go back to what we were just talking about. How about the obedience of faith or a work of faith? What is a work of faith? Hear and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is for us saying. He's tried us as silver is tried. In the wilderness, God purified the Israelites to enter Canaan. But you know what it took? It took 40 years and the death of a whole generation of people who didn't believe. Or, let me say, they didn't trust. Because as soon as they got out there in the wilderness, what did they start doing? Oh, we want to go back to Egypt. It was better back there. They were looking back instead of looking forward because it wasn't very long. What was it, about a month that they left Sinai and they went to Kadesh Barnea? 
And the spies went in and said, let's go. Well, two of them said, let's go. Ten of them said, we can't do it. And the people believed the, two, the ten that said, we can't do it. And that caused a whole generation to die in the wilderness. Canaan was already filled with wicked people. God didn't need any more wicked people in there, so he left those people in the wilderness to die until they were purified by the trials and tribulations that they faced in the desert. And that next generation came up. And God said, now you're ready. Now you're ready. Think about that. Well, weren't, weren't they just as bad as Pharaoh to a degree? Yes, they were. Does that mean none of them were saved? I, 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 I wouldn't say that. I, saved eternally. I, I think there were some who were probably very repentant because of what they had done. And they probably turned and made their hearts right with God, but they still died in the wilderness. They didn't get to that promised land there. In Psalm 65, we're told God redeemed Israel in order to recreate in them his image and to provide them with everything they would need to worship and serve him. That's the previous psalm. Okay? That's what God is doing. But isn't that what God is doing with us? To recreate us in his image and provide us with everything to worship and serve Him. He does that. What God did for Israel, that's what He's doing for the church, and that means for us. He recreates and provides. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. It is for discipline that you have to endure. Discipline. That's how God brings that recreation, and that's how he provides what we need uh, to worship and serve him. What do we need to worship and serve him? Faith. 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 Trust. Trust. Hope. Hope. Obedience. Obedience. Discipline. Discipline. Humbleness of heart. There's a host of things, but we can find them in the Scripture. And God is doing, providing that for us through what? That discipline and the trials and tribulations we're facing here in like the desert as we are heading for the promised land. And hopefully we're a little more faithful than what those Israelites were. God is treating you as sons. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which you have all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Either that or what? Your father doesn't love you, right? Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Yeah, you learn. When that belt comes off and it goes snap, snap, you pay attention, right? Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us, that's our earthly fathers, for a short time as it seemed best to them, Maybe sometimes it was proper. Maybe sometimes it just wasn't proper. But you know what? It didn't kill us. It didn't kill us. But he disciplines, disciplines us for our good. Mm -hmm. That we may share his holiness. And what is his holiness? That's that, that concept of separate. Separate. Being set apart for God's use. That's what we are called to be. Set apart from the world for God's use. Verse 11, for the, moment of, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been by it. When we accept it. When somebody comes and says, Fred, 
you messed up. If I say, I don't want to hear it from you because you are a low down skunk and you, 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 you and I just won't listen to them, then there's a problem with me. I haven't received the discipline. I said, what do you mean? And they explained it to me. You know, you're right. I'm sorry. Say those nine words. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Oh, have I learned something from discipline? Has discipline, has that trained me? And does that bring a peaceful fruit of righteousness then into my life? Well, sure. And that's what David is talking about here. Why did God lead them through the wilderness for 40 years? To get them to repent. You're not, getting, you're not going into the promised land, but that was a physical thing, right? Could they still go to heaven? Yes. Yes. Probably a lot of them didn't, but they had to have that training, that discipline. Now, David relates what God has done corporately to personal worship. To personal worship. What we do here is corporate worship. <clears throat> we go home, we get in our room, like Jesus said, when you pray, get in your room by yourself in the dark. That's private worship personal worship. And he looks at the history of Israel and realizes what God has done for the nation. So you, you look at that and then you break it down into those parts. Uh, he also realizes that without the nation of Israel, you know what? There'd be no King David. Right? David says, if there wasn't an Israel there'd be no me. Hmm. And without King David, there'd be no Messiah. Oh. And if there's no Messiah, you know what else? We have no hope. So David begins to understand what place he holds in God's plan of redemption. The place that he holds Israel has a place, but he has a place in that. Follow me? He's not the beginning. He's not the end. He's just a link in the chain, isn't he? And you know what? A chain is only as strong as what? Its weakest link. So David decided that he was not going to be the weak Link. Saul was a pretty weak link and almost destroyed the whole thing, right? King Saul? David said, I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to turn away from God. He was going to keep the promises he made to God when he was in trouble. God, God has a lot of fair weather or foul weather friends, right? When things are going bad, God save me. But when things are going good, who's God? You know? He was going to offer the best when he offered a sacrifice to God. And that's what he's talking about. You get, you get the best. I will offer the best that I have. He was going to be a man of God among the people of the world. Regardless. Now, realizing his place in God's plan, what does David do? He turns to the hearer, right? Well, how do you know that, Fred? Look at verses 16 through 19. Come and hear, all you who fear God. Now, if you don't fear God, don't pay attention to this. Don't pay attention to the rest of this. Just forget about it. But come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. David, what are you trying to tell us? What are you trying to tell us who fear God? 
trying to tell us that what God has done for him, God will do for us. Okay? Remember? Greater to the lesser arguments. Lesser to greater arguments and such. Since God blessed Israel, God will bless the church. Right? Yeah, that's the way God does it. And that's what the Bible's telling us. Since God blessed David... God will bless Jesus' disciples. Okay? David received blessings because he was of the nation of Israel. Disciples re receive blessings because they are the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Spiritual blessings. In what? Paul says, heavenly places. And I think... Peter even says something very similar to that. Israel had a grand and glorious history, right? It wasn't perfect. They weren't perfect. But so does the church. But here's the difference. Where Israel had an end, the church has a future. Read the scriptures. Israel had an end. God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. It's going to be an everlasting covenant. Uh, how long did that covenant last? Till the end of the covenant. It was everlasting. Till the end of the covenant. And then what happened? There's a new covenant. How long is that new covenant going to last? Till the end of the covenant. <laughs> Till Jesus comes back. The church has a future. The history of the church is reason for us to praise God, but the future of the church is a greater reason for us to praise God. Between now and the future greatness of the church exists our generation, which means what? Us, you and me, right? You and me. And just as David decided not to be a weak link in the plan, we have to make the choice to be strong in the Lord. We have to make the choice not to be the weak link in that chain that keeps going. See what David's trying to get through to us? So Psalm 66, verse 20. Blessed be God because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Did God have a right to remove his steadfast love from David? A mm, couple times, right? A <laughs> couple times he could have said, you're a duster. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, that's kind of a, a, is that what you call a euphemism? There, there's, some, there's a thing behind that because some men, <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's like a peacock. He struts around, you know, showing his feathers. But someday he's just going to end up being a feather duster. <laughs> yeah. and, and some men are like that. A wonderful friend. I knew him for the time we were in Waxahachie. He was a preacher, older guy. He, he used to talk about uh, knowing men that uh, they, uh, how, how would he put it? Uh, they, they were kind of like this, they were so full of pride they could strut while they were sitting down. <laughs> <You know>, just, <laughs> it's the type of people they were. And, and now, now that's, you see that in the Bible though, don't you? You see people like that. And David said, you could have you removed. There were times in David's life when he thought he, he could get away with anything. But he had to be shown that he was wrong. He had a place in the history of Israel, and, and, and I wouldn't even deny that that's a place in the history of God's plan of salvation that would include the church, too. But folks, we have a place. We're the heritage of the church's past, and we're the bridge to the church's future. It doesn't matter how bad things look. <laughs> it's, it's just plain and simple. We are. And if the majesty of God is not a reality in our lives and our efforts of worship and service 
They're going to be weak and they're going to be without fruit. So we have to remember that. If the majesty of God is a reality in our lives, our worship and service to God will be vibrant and we're going to bear fruit. Well, we'll bear spiritual fruit. Eventually, we'll bear physical fruit. God will take care of that because God's the one who's in charge of the fruit. So the majesty of God deserves the worship of men. All men. But it begins with us, doesn't it? It starts with us. What a wonderful God we serve. Amen. Oh, my time's up. That's good because that was the end of my lesson. Thank you so much for your time, for your attention. If you have a need, please let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation.